Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's The Sidebar, taking you inside the courtrooms and trials of high profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter, a criminal defense lawyer based here in Los Angeles, and previously I was an LA County prosecutor for nearly a decade. We are recording this on Monday, March 21st, 2022. And today we are joined by Robert Simon, a trial attorney and co-founder of the Simon Law Group. Specializing in civil litigation, Robert has fought for justice for his clients, securing them millions of dollars in compensation for injuries or ailments in the process. Robert, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Privileged to be here and hopefully I don't like downgrade your talent that you've had on the show. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Today, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Usually we talk about high profile cases and the criminal criminal aspect of it. Uh, But today we're talking about cases making headlines from the perspective of the civil side of things. And that's why we're so happy to have you on, uh, Robert, and uh, help us to dive into that and explain to folks uh, the difference between the two. And so jumping right in. If you are a sports fan, uh, you have been following this case pretty closely, and that is dealing with Deshaun Watson. Uh, Watson was, until recently, the Texas uh, Texans quarterback. Well, there's an update. He is now playing for the Browns, giving Deshaun a new deal. And per sources, that is, listen to this, $184 million for the first four years of his contract. Uh, it's a $48 million raise over the 136 he was scheduled to make over the same four years on the previous contract. Um, however, in spite of all of this, in the, in, the, in the background, as it were, 22 women have filed claims against Watson, accusing him of sexual misconduct. Um, and two of those f- are for sexual assault as well. Lawsuits have been filed in Harris County, Texas, and representing the victims in this case is Tony Busby, a well-known injury lawyer in the area who deals with large uh, profile cases uh, like the, um, those stemming from the Hurricane Ike and the BP oil spill. Watson has been reportedly uh, refused a six-figure offer by Busby, and a grand jury uh decided not to indict Watson. He ran the table on that, as it were, with nine uh, uh, counts that they found not to have had sufficient evidence. So um, my first question, in dealing with these uh, high-profile cases, Robert, Watson w- has been relatively quiet on this matter. How, how b- big of an asset is that to the plaintiffs to have kind of their narrative out in the public without his response? Well, I think it's actually a huge positive for Watson to be to remain quiet, let things play out, because he's kind of maintained his um, his innocence or his not guiltiness, if that's a term that you guys use. Um, <laughs> sure. From, from the onset. So, look, I just want to, you know, there's that old phrase that we learn in, in law school, right? It says you can indict a ham sandwich at a grand jury, right? Because it's all one sided. Right. So it doesn't right. really speak too well for the evidence they have against Mr. Watson if you have a grand jury, which all one-sided stuff yeah. that did co- didn't come out too well. And, you know, Busby's a really, really, really good lawyer. You know, I know him professionally. A lot of these other people that represent these other folks civilly, I know them. We're all in the same circles. And, you know, he does a lot of, like, these bigger, almost like class, mass-type injury folks, like with the oil spill and all these other folks. And if he is trying to leverage a six-figure, not a seven-figure settlement with all of these victims – there's a reason why that that's that's happening and why Watson continually to say no. And again, the other update we heard, you know, that's all guaranteed money. First of all, he's getting from from Cleveland. So Cleveland's getting into guarantee, giving guaranteed money. The NFL apparently hasn't even really investigated this. Right. So that doesn't bode too well for the civil case. It seems the Browns, if you're going to make any investment, that they're going to do it very bullishly. Um, without any type of fear. So I kind of, that's where it is, man. Yeah, explain that to, to people listening. Why is, that, why is that significant that they gave him all this guaranteed money when there's this possible litigation and even at the time, maybe even possible criminal exposure while they were negotiating this deal with him? They got to do their due diligence. It's like with any, you know, I have a lot of companies that I own outside of the practice of law. And if you're acquiring another company or an asset, you're going to do your due diligence, right? To make sure that they're not into a, another lawsuit that might devalue the company or there's not something else that's going on. They've done their homework. They had to have. I mean, these are high level professionals. So from the civil, the civil side of these is you have to ask yourself several questions. One, why have they not filed 
filed any civil lawsuits. There are complaints, right? I mean, there are accusations, but why have they filed anything specifically against Deshaun Watson? Do they really value their their evidence? And you also have to be, I represent a lot of sexual assault victims. There's a very sensitive thing underbelly is that all of these victims, once you get onto the civil side, they are the plaintiff. They're the person bringing the lawsuit. They have a burden of proof. So if you have a burden burden of proof, you have to go in there and realize that your life is going to be put under a microscope. You're going to have to show what he did was wrong, why it was wrong, and what are your damages due to that. And once you put that at issue, everything that's ever happened to you is going to come into play. Because the other side, again, I only represent consumers, victims, always. The other side is going to go in and hire an expert, a psychologist that says, all of these things you're feeling are because something else happened to you before this, or maybe you were in a strange relationship, or maybe you were abused. All the stuff's going to come front and center. So that's why it's very hard for victims to come out and have their story be heard. It takes a lot of courage. Um, but that's what you have to look at as, you know, when I represent these victims, I have to have a very real conversation. I just had one with somebody I met with is, if you're doing this, you have to be willing to go forward because this is what it's going to look like for you personally. And you have to have that courage to stand up and I'll be there with you. But that's the reality of the situation, the underbelly. And, and yep. you know, and his attorney like me is working on a contingency fee for this. You know, they don't get paid per hour. They get paid perhaps. So they have to make sure that they are very bullish and, you know, their right of recovery and signs like he's made some demands, demand letters to Watson and his team that have kind of fallen upon deaf ears. And really yeah. with Watson, what could they do? Like if he's negotiating these settlements while trying to get signed by a team, that doesn't, that's not a good look either. So now that he's signed, maybe you might see a few other chips fall or maybe these do get resolved and uh, maybe with confidentiality agreements, things like this, but we shall yeah. see. I want to go back to something you said earlier about <laughs> indicting a, a ham sandwich and to explain to people watching uh, an, in, an indictment in front of a grand jury is a very different process than, than we're used to seeing in the criminal world. Usually 99% of cases go through, especially here in California, what's called a preliminary hearing, where both sides are present in court. So you have maybe the victim take the stand and testify, but you're also going to have cross-examination from the defense attorney and representation by the re uh, defense attorney. And perhaps they even put on a case of their own. In the grand jury, you don't have that. You just have the prosecutor presents all of the evidence themselves, and they have a certain duty to present some exculpatory evidence, but it, they don't have to present all of it. And so the the point that you're making is that usually the, the skills are very heavily tipped towards securing an indictment. So when you have nine indictments that didn't come back, meaning that the grand jury found there was not enough evidence, even in that kind of skewed, biased environment to not return indictments on nine people, that's a big deal, as you point out, but help us to understand how would that change the landscape and the dynamic of these plaintiffs? Are they going to now start trying to run towards those 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 offers that maybe they had to settle before? Or is Deshaun so kind of secure in his position that he says, you know, let's see how far you guys want to take this? I mean, and that's the thing is right now, um, you, you know, there's two different standards right now. So we're talking about the criminal one where there's an ad indictment, potential indictment. And literally, it's all one side. Imagine going in and having just people hear your side of the argument and say, OK, well, how do you feel about that? Would you agree with me? Well, you're hearing one side of the argument. Usually you check the box and say, yeah, OK, we agree with you because you didn't hear all the other stuff. That's the that's the criminal side. So on the civil side, there's a different burden, a burden of proof. So on the criminal, which is the underlying stuff we're going to talk about through all of these. All of our listeners and viewers think about this. Everyone remembers the OJ case, right? OJ, not guilty, criminal, liable on a civil lawsuit. Two different standards. So it's beyond a reasonable doubt. Very high standard. you got to balance the scales. Very high to convict somebody, right? In civil, it's not. It's more likely true than not true in most all jurisdictions. That's 50.01%. When I give closing arguments, it's like, you know, a feather's enough to tell, tip the scales. That's it. More likely true than not true. That's your only burden of proof. So it's it's much. The evidence is weighed differently. So if the you know the victims when they file a lawsuit, it could be their evidence could just be this. This happened to me. That's your evidence. If the jury believes it, you win. More likely true than not true. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. So the burdens are different. So there's that. What happened with the grand jury or what happens criminally rarely, if ever, gets into any type of evidence in the civil side, unless there's a felony conviction. Then it's you're proposed to have committed that crime that then you're civilly liable for. But usually this stuff's not even coming up in a civil trial. Unless they, yeah. unless the victims came and testified and was unsealed, they can get into that in the civil right. side. 
Another thing you had talked about a little bit earlier is that you have to prepare your clients who are, are plaintiffs and victimized for what the, the rigors of discovery is basically what you're talking about, that they're going to have to answer a bunch of questions. They're going to have to turn over a bunch of documents. They might even have to subject themselves to depositions um, and how that really puts anything that they're any allegation they're making under the microscope, in, including their entire history. It's funny because in this case, uh, according to his attorney, at least, uh, uh, um, Watson's attorney is a gentleman named Rusty Hardin. They are looking forward to the depositions in this case because he says this will be his first time that he will have the opportunity to share his side of the story. And I imagine what they're talking about there is he had probably been under uh, a, a very careful Fifth Amendment protection when there was this pending criminal investigation that he's no longer kind of shackled by now. Can you kind of help people mm -hmm. understand how that all works with the Fifth Amendment and testifying and why what, why is he so happy for this opportunity at this point? OK, so once he has the criminal side beside him, which looks like it, it probably has. I mean, they can always bring new charges or try again. Um, and, you know, and Rusty is very well known for in the industry of defending a lot of well-known, especially baseball players. He's Roger Clemens guy back in the day. Um, Rusty's got a big bar, got a big bark. I don't know if he's trying a lot of cases these days and, and defending it. And he's very good at what he does. But when, when you get to the civil side, right? So there is no fifth amendment. There is a fifth amendment privilege, which you can invoke fine. But in the civil side, especially in California, the case law in California is unlike the criminal side, the civil side, they can kind of hold that against you. If you because it comes in evidence, and they say, hey, plead the fifth. And then you get to explain what that is. And if somebody's not liable, why wouldn't they say anything? It's a different burden. So in the civil side, it sounds like he's going to hear his side of the story. And sometimes his side of the story is going to be asking and probing questions of the the victims. Um, most jurisdictions, a deposition is a public proceeding civilly. Public proceeding means you can, if you wanted to, live stream it unless there's a protective order. Wow. You, I mean, I do this. We teach a lot. Like I have a company called Justice HQ. We train a lot of lawyers how to do things the right way. And we live stream a lot of depositions. We give notice in the deposition notice so everybody can see and learn from it. Well, unless you have a court order saying you can't do it, it is open to the public and you could live stream these things. Now, I assume in a case like this that they will have a, if their attorney's good, will have a protective order, they won't be able to do these things. But look, that's a real possibility. When I tell my clients these things, you have to be willing to tell your mom or dad what happened to you and be willing to tell your mom or dad all of your sexual exploits because they're going to get into this. So, yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Well, yeah. uh, a fascinating story. We'll, we'll, we will continue to watch it. Um, switching gears, though, uh, for a second to a case that even if you're a casual kind of follower of uh, legal news or just frankly haven't been living under a rock, you know about the rust shooting involving Alec Baldwin. The estate of Helena Hutchins, the Russ cinematographer, is pursuing a wrongful death lawsuit. Uh, she was killed in October in the onset shooting of a prop gun being held by Mr. Baldwin, the actor, uh, the film's star and producer. And uh, Alec Baldwin famously has a few times now publicly denied any wrongdoing. Um, some interesting th stuff that we've learned lately is that there are multiple accounts of safety violations taking place on the production and on set some in order to cuss costs. Uh, this was a funny uh, grievance to me, but some members of the camera crew were denied hotel rooms near the film set, according to a report. And members of the camera crew were told by the production staff that it was unsafe for them to spend an extra two hours driving to and from Albuquerque on Interstate 25, a rural four lane highway with a 75 mile per hour speed limit. Well, the production staff was mocked for their request for hotel rooms with custom T-shirts that the L.A. Times reported on where someone on the production staff had ordered custom long sleeve T-shirts with error 404 housing not found and ABQ is an hour away printed on them. <laughs> uh, most recently, and this made a lot of news, Brian Panish, who you're, you're familiar with, the attorney representing the plaintiffs, released a detailed computer-generated reenactment of the shooting. Okay, so jumping right in, let's talk about that video, first of oh, all. Man. What are your thoughts oh. on that? Was that a smart move oh, gosh. Uh, for the plaintiff, or was it a potential oversell on their part? No, I think it was a genius move. And I know um, Alex at DK Global that did that animation, and he's the man like the stuff that they go that they put into this is 
I mean, first of all, it's very expensive. And these guys are animation artists that get it down and they can find tweak it. And, you know, once you use it, once it's out there, it's going to be part of the lawsuit because the other side is going to be able to see all the rend renderings and, you know, where you went, who had input with this. Um, you know, at the end of the day, though, let's be honest, Josh, this stuff's never seen a courtroom. Right. It is the, the deck is so stacked against Baldwin, the entire team, and the things that the cost, the corners that were cut on costs and safety in this case, it's going to rise to the level of punitive damages if they want to get there. Look, if I'm smart, oh, for sure. Like if I've heard and seen these things, because again, I'm friends with Brian Panish and Randy McGinn, who's um, the co counsel on this. She's in New Mexico. So they got two of the best lawyers like in the world on this on this case. And Panish is a behemoth. Um, I've tried cases with the guy, and it not only was it a whole, it's a hilarious experience. But the dude's one of the best ever. He did the Michael Jackson trial, if you guys remember that back in the day. Um, he's hit Ford for a billion, yes, a billion dollars. Um, wow. But he's the real deal. And Randy is the most effective litigator trial lawyer that I think I have ever personally seen. Um, I've been on panels with her, and she's just a very gifted trial lawyer in person. And look, man, in New Mexico, she is like God there and look her up, Randy with an eye again. She's, she's yeah. just genius. But, but here's, but the reality is civilly again, burden of proof is different, more likely true than not true. You're going to have the production company on the hook. You're going to have Alec Baldwin personally on the hook. Then you start looking at who's going to be able to pay for these things. Well, most listeners of yours don't know this, but your homeowners or your renters policy will cover your negligent acts. If Alec Baldwin goes in and says, he negligently thought that the gun was not loaded, blah, 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 which he should do. It triggers his insurance company to pay for it and defend the case and pay all of the costs of the case. Wow. Right? Yes. So that's why you see in a lot of these complaints, like they do here, they plead negligence as one of the causes of action. Because once you plead negligence, it means the insurance company has to step in, they got to defend, they got to pay the costs and likely have to pay the amount. Now there's a limit as to how much they can pay is the insurance limit. Um, now, the insurance limit here, I would assume if Al Bald were smart, he'd have very, very high limits of personal insurance for his personal negligence and should have a an additional insured on the production company. Because I think if I recall correctly, he also was a producer on this. So he's going to be on the hook for that as well. Right. Um, the one thing the insurance companies do not cover, though, on your policy are intentional acts. So they will not cover punitive damages. Okay. Punitive damages are to punish for the wrongdoing, not to make whole the person who was hurt, injured, who, who died, but to punish. So when it goes to the jury sheets, they're going to say, how much do you award for, for the estate of the woman who passed away? How much you how much do you award for you know, the loss of love, companionship for the people that left behind? What is that number for those people that lost their loved one? What is that number? And then the next question is, say, do you find malice, oppression or fraud by Baldwin production company, whoever? And if they check yes to that box, it goes to another phase where they bring on the financials. This is where they're going to get into all the financials. How much money does Alec Baldwin have? You know, is is his wife's accent real? Like, is this all going to be on the table? <laughs> <laughs> like, this is once you. This is why this case is never going to go that far because you're going to start getting into the personal finances of Alec Baldwin, the personal balance sheets, because that's all going to be part of the punitive damages case. Uh, because they did cut major corners. If you talk to anybody in the industry, I know people that were set to work there and do things and they refused during to the city just because of the safety condition this was before it happened right wow. um, Ex explain yeah. to people listening how rare that is a, a punitive punitive damages aspect in a, in a case like this it is extremely rare um it is pled a lot just sometimes for leverage to try to get the insurance companies to pay and protect their insured so they're not subject to those punishment damages right but it is and i've tried a lot of cases I have never gotten punitive damages. It's very hard to get, right? I'm in the American Board of Trial Advocates. Like you have to have certain credentials. I've done a lot of big verdicts. It's never got that box checked for me because it's such a high standard. So again, talking about burden of, burden of proof, more likely true than not true was, you know, how much is that the life worth of somebody that was taken away? Were they negligent? Now, if you're talking about the punitives, malice, oppression, or fraud, preponderance of the evidence. So it's higher. It's not quite as high as the criminal side, but it's much higher. Right. So it's harder to prove that you have to, like, be pretty sure, not super sure, but like pretty sure what they did was malice, oppression or fraud. And, and that's where the the awards can really get astronomical. Right. Because now you, you are essentially asking a jury, OK, now we've opened up their books. You see what they're worth. 
what what is a fair amount to make them hurt to punish them essentially for what they've done here right correct and that's where it, it, it's different like in every jurisdiction how you get awarded this punitive damages and i think the reason why that the case was filed so the, you can the venue you can file where the incident took place if it's a car crash if it's an oil spill to where it happened but you can also file the case where the defendant resides or their principal place of business so you can pick new york i think that's where i think that's where baldwin's primary place of businesses and maybe the production companies in california maybe registered in delaware i think the reason why new mexico is one of the best states in the 50 states for protecting consumers and their rights very good laws very good laws on punitive damages very good laws on um, awarding damages to people that are injured they're very anti-corporations which i think every state should be like they have modeled new mexico is fantastic so the reason why they filed it there rather than picking probably California or New York is because those laws are so good to help people that are hurt in, in circumstances like these. Baldwin can't keep his mouth shut about this. Oh God. And, and I'm curious, um, I, I imagine uh, knowing who his attorney is, is that that is that is an attorney having trouble controlling his client. How much do you think that's hurting him? And how much have you ever experienced that where you just cannot get a client to keep their mouth shut especially if they're a celebrity type folk. And this is why I I don't I like representing more common people rather than these types of like celebrities that can't stop talking to folks cuz I don't know. I represent a lot of just blue collar workers and stuff because they don't go do this stuff and I can't even imagine their lawyers pulling their hair out every time he makes some a statement or goes on Twitter. It's like, "Come on, man." Cuz you know, there's also a potential criminal aspect. I don't and this would be more in your wheelhouse. I don't, you know, I don't foresee going to that path, but I mean, it's certainly civilly liable. I mean, they're kind of I mean, they're not it's not looking good for them. Could, could those statements come back to haunt him? Like is that something yeah. they could could be used in 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 court? Yeah. So the way the civil works is anything, any statement against the interest or any statement whatsoever, pretty much from either party, plaintiff or defend the person bringing a suit or defending the lawsuit is fair game. Um, so if it's against your interest, you know, the word that hearsay word that we hear all the time, you know, out of state, out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter. One of the exceptions is if you made a statement, it was against your, you know, the stuff that you're saying now it's coming in. So all these things, every time he's making a tweet, every time he's saying something to media, every time, I mean, trust me, Panish's team and McGinn's team, they're recording it, they're saving it, and they're just seething to take his deposition because you know he's going to lie and then it's going to be played, him impeaching himself on the stand. You ask him a question to play a video where he says exactly the opposite. I mean, yeah. it's not going to look good for him. So yeah, it could get could get ugly. He doesn't right, have last... the SNL writers for this one, Josh. Not gonna... <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question on this. The the media news outlets when they're covering this everybody makes a big deal over the fact that he's holding the gun and i'm not trying to say that that's a small thing but do you think for his personal liability that is is that as big an issue to you the fact that he was the one holding the gun and i guess my ultimate question is are if you're representing baldwin are you worried about his personal liability in this case he is going to be personally i mean i believe and again thinking about the back channels you have to have money there to be able to compensate the folks who, who lost a loved one insurance has to be played in order for that to be triggered you want him to be negligent at least look man you don't hold a gun whether you think it's loaded or not in that fashion right there's all these different things that you're yeah. going to be be able to put out there because you have to be able to compensate these folks you don't want to go get like a we call just like a paper judgment or a billboard verdict where you're never going to collect on it they want to be able to collect i mean who knows alec baldwin might be so upside down in his finances you might not get a penny from him individually so you have to be able to think this way for the family but when they're defending him, this is where it, the insurance companies get into a lot of a lot of trouble in the back end they have to be him personally if he's personally liable but they also want the production company to be liable too, which you might be part, part owner of, and they might want somebody else to be liable as well. But at the end of the day, it might mean that one of them has to pay or one might not have to pay. So there's a big conflict of interest. And believe me, they are turning the screws, Panish and his team are turning the screws on these conflict of interest the insurance company's having with actually Alec Baldwin and the production company, et cetera. Look, if it were me, I would be on the Rust with the team at Rust and I'd be offering the plaintiffs like a percentage of all net revenue that comes from this film 
And I would have a very altruistic, yeah, this happened. We're going to compensate the family. I'd make a PR marketing push to make that part of getting people to watch. It's almost like a GoFundMe. Please go watch this movie so that the family can continue to get compensated a percentage of the net revenue. I, get, I would be so creative in this and try to turn a negative into a positive. I mean, we cannot bring this woman back. Hopefully they can make things safer here. And I, I bet you they've gotten reamed with their safety issues. Um, that's a big thing that lawsuits do incite safety measures and they do make the world safer. I'm a big believer and I do a lot of product liability cases. I have seen it. I've seen it happen. And that's the only way to hold people accountable. Uh, that's why the American judicial system is so, so special. And that's why Abraham Lincoln said behind serving for serving military, the most patriotic thing an American can do is serve on a jury trial. <laughs> so. I. I try to remind people who are trying to get kicked off of juries that all the time. That's the number one question I get as a lawyer. How do I get off a jury? <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to find my way on. People won't let me on. <laughs> Messed up. Um, all right. Let's talk about the Travis Scott concert. This was a complete tragedy. Um, Ten people were killed and hundreds of others injured in a deadly crowd surge during Scott's headlining performance at NRG Park in the rapper's hometown of Houston. Uh, this took place at the rapper's Astro World Festival. The 10 deaths varied in age from nine years old to 27. Dozens of others were crushed and trampled in the crowd surge. Um, Travis Scott and Live Nation are facing one giant lawsuit. And when I say giant, I mean giant. There are 400 individually filed cases seeking B, billions with a B of dollars in damages after the Astro World tragedy. Uh, Scott repeatedly didn't realize, uh, uh, reportedly, pardon me, didn't realize that the severity of what was happening as the crowd, uh, as he continued to play for another 37 minutes after the show had been declared a mass casualty incident. Um, first of all, t explain to us, how does this work getting this large amount of, of people together in, in a group of plaintiffs? And what, what are the advantages uh, to the plaintiffs there? they're getting people together to have commonality and claims and try to figure out how much each loss is worth right so there is a very big advantage to having all of the plaintiffs in one one concentrated effort the reason being that's leverage if you have the ability to have all these claims together and asking for billions of dollars if the only way they're going to be able to to get this done is to settle all of them but if they try to start picking out the best ones and settle them out, all of the people that might have lesser claims lose all of that leverage, right? So, you know, realistically what happens in these cases is there's these big digital marketing companies. As soon as an event like this happens, they start hitting up Facebook and all these things and all these attorneys start getting all this information of all these people that were injured. And then they start to get them to the best lawyers. They funnel it up and split the fee. So the best lawyers that actually control these things and are on steering committees to make sure that things are, you know, handled appropriately. Um, the big, I mean, again, this is another one like the rust one where they're in a lot of trouble. I mean, these things just do not happen, right? These things should never happen. Live nation is going to be in a lot of trouble. They probably have an indemnification agreement. I would suspect with Travis Scott that says that they will indemnify or that they will be the person to hold harmless and pay any and all um, things that come from this. There's likely in the contract, because I, I host a lot of events where we have artists for lawyers, like we do Lotta Gras and Bourbon Approve. And, you know, you have to indemnify the host of these things because they don't know. They're not the ones setting up the safety protocol. It's usually the production company or here at Live Nation. They're the ones that are making the big profit off of it. Um, so, yeah, again, insurance companies on the back end, they, I will bet you Live Nation has hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of insurance on, on for something just like this. Um, but will they have to pay out of their own pocket? You know, we shall see. But when they're asking for billions, do they have that much coverage? And I think a lot of people would be shocked to know that a lot of these big co companies and corporations have so much coverage. Right. So never never feel bad about suing them because they've been paying for insurance. For <laughs> I'm sure, <laughs> sure folks don't feel bad about suing them. Yeah. Um, you, you use that term indemnify you're saying that you, you you imagine that Live Nation has indemnified Scott. Explain to us what that means as far as like, does that mean he might not pay a nickel out of his own pocket uh, if, if a, an award is uh, granted here? I Yeah, if, if things are set up smartly from the, the you know artist promotion side, they usually will have an agreement where Live Nation will agree to, you know, if anything happens, they'll be the ones that hold that are on the hook for it and their insurance company will take we'll take care of it. You know, Scott may have something individual insurance they may have to kick in or something like that, but I cannot imagine a world where his, the people around him did not have that clause with Live Nation when they went out and did it. Um, 
yeah, I just, I mean, I, I would not foresee him having to pay a dollar out of his own pocket if it's if it's done correctly. And again, it just matters how much how much insurance does Live Nation have. Uh, they've got a pretty big, big pocket. Unless we find out that he did something intentionally to make this worse, or he had made the call right, on X, Y, Z. But we don't know the back end of those contracts. You know. That, because that was going to be my next question is there's all this chatter about, well, he should have seen and people were trying to alert him and he should have stopped the concert sooner. It sounds like all of that won't amount to much of anything if the Live Nation is going to cover him anyways. Yeah, that's I mean, it's such a difficult thing to be able to, you know, you have somebody out there performing, they're doing what they were paid a contract to do. And in that contract, like they said, you go do what you're good at. We'll take care of this stuff, which is the safety measures to make sure there's no, the people aren't, this doesn't happen. I mean, that's, there's likely something that's written in black and white in between their contracts. It's going to clearly delineate for a jury or somebody who's the one that's on the hook to pay. Uh, so yeah, that's, we'll see how that goes. But again, Houston, you know, where this happened, Texas, that area, um, you know, I'm licensed in Texas. We have offices there too. It's very good for, for consumer protection, stuff like this. So um, get ready live nation to pay out a lot of money or else it's kind of look real bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, one last thing that is this case is in the news most recently because um, a gag order was issued by the judge, barring attorneys involved in the lawsuit from talking about the case in ways that could potentially sway jurors. Yeah. However, um, Scott is being criticized by the plaintiffs because in in an effort is seemingly to try to avoid this gag order. He has been using a charitable organization um, to carry out what they are describing as highly sophisticated marketing campaign. I, what what are your thoughts on this? Explain to us how these these orders work in practice, and and is there a little bit of kind of shenanigans, as it were, taking place by Scott and using this charitable oh. organization to avoid that? You know, back in the day, gag orders had a lot more teeth and a lot more accountability because you could see when it, who said it and who said what. You know, we're living in the in the world now again of, of a digital marketing presence of of Twitter and ghost accounts and stuff. I mean how are you going to be able to track these servers that are off, you know, offshore and all, and who said what, you know, is he, does he have a very sophisticated machine that's doing these things in the background? I mean, his pre arc team is probably trying to do the best they can to salvage his career, his identity. I mean, if I was lawyer, I'd just tell him, don't say crap, man, just keep a muzzle on it, you know, but you know, they're trying to do a spin that whatever, however they can at, at the end of the day. So what a gag order is when a judge says neither side can go off and talk about it. If they go talk about it in the public, because you're trying to sway the potential jurors in the future, um, we're going to fine you or do something or hold like an evidentiary sanction against you if you do something like that. And they can have a lot of teeth to them, but again, it's very hard. It's good to say, but then the accountability to actually enforce, it's going to be, well, how do you know that so-and-so directed so-and-so to do a tweet that did X, Y, Z? Um, and what they're worried of, again, this is something that's, this case ain't never getting to a jury. There's just no yeah, way. Okay. You're asking for a billion dollars and 400 claimants. I mean, that, a trial will take three years, you know, logistically, right. um, even with like a fast track type stuff. So anyway, they're trying to sway potential jurors that are going to hear a jury trial in a year or two years from now with information they saw on Twitter. Whatever. It's just it's unrealistic, but I see the point. Gotcha. Well, I'm sure it's a case that's not going to go away anytime soon, so we'll continue to watch it. Um, the last case I wanted to talk about today is uh, another one that just kind of gripped the attention of the nation. But uh, in the death of Gabby Petito by the hands of her um, her boyfriend at the time, Brian Laundry, the Petito family has now sued the Laundry uh, parents. Uh, they filed a lawsuit in a Florida court against the parents of Brian Laundry, alleging that they knew of Gabby's murder. The couple had been traveling in Moab, uh, Utah, when Gabby was last seen. Mm -hmm. They were separated at one point by Utah police during a domestic dispute. We've all seen that video where they're talking to her and she's very, uh, she's very kind of upset and crying. And Petito's remains were later found in Wyoming one month after she disappeared. And following that, a weeks long manhunt ensued for laundry. Laundry skeletal remains were found in Sarasota County in October and his death was ruled a suicide. And the FBI claimed that he had claimed responsibility for the claim, uh, the killing in a notebook. Uh, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt, the parents of uh, Gabby, claimed that Laundry 
advised his parents that he had murdered Gabrielle Petito. The lawsuit claims actions of Laundrie's parents caused Gabby's parents to suffer pain and suffering, mental anguish, inconvenience, loss of capacity for enjoyment of life and experience in the past that, um, that, and to be experienced in the future. Um, but an interesting thing that stood out to me, and I, I don't know enough about this, and I'm hoping you can kind of shed some light on it, is that according to reports, the Petitos are seeking, uh, and it's described as only no less than $30,000. To me, that seemed shockingly low. And w can you explain that to us? What is that based upon? Where do they come up with those numbers? So they're saying no less than? Correct. It's a jurisdictional thing. You know, once you get under that threshold, you are in like a different division. This is in, I believe they filed in Florida. So yeah. it's like a, a different threshold. So there's like here in California, they move small claims up to 15,000. So you have to say an amount in excess of 15,000 to get you out of small claims court. It's just a procedural thing. You don't have to put a specific number you're seeking for in, um, in pleadings. Often I do not when we do this because you don't want to be again married to that number. Maybe it goes up, maybe it goes down, uh, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I mean it's very interesting. You know, it's then we start talking about all the stuff we learned about law school. Like, where does the duty? Like, what duty do you have for the parents to be able to do something for the parents of so and so if they learn something? You know, um, but you know it goes back to you know Josh, you do your high very high profile criminal defense lawyer. I'm sure you've had um, clients show up at your home or office, knock on the door and give you a dollar and say, all right, now we have attorney client privilege. I have a dead body in the trunk. <laughs> what right. <do> I do? <laughs> that happens. Where, you, where, you can talk about the shovels. It. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you can't, you know, you can't do anything in furtherance of a crime, right? You can't do anything that tries to cover it up right after it's already happened, blah, blah, blah. I mean, we could talk about this forever, but I presume that the, the things we've talked about with having a different burden of proof with having, um, potential insurance dollars that could compensate the parents of the girl that died, that could be a play of the Florida civil lawsuit. Because again, if they plead negligence, like, hey, you could have, if you knew this information, you may have been able to prevent it. You were negligent doing so. And they could say some, you know, intentional stuff too. But again, that could trigger insurance companies. And again, for, for a lot of times, you know, I'll file lawsuits on behalf of individuals that just want answers. And they don't get answers to the criminal aspect because they're not a party to the criminal case. It's the, the, the people versus the person that committed the crime. And the victim is not a party to that. So they're not privy to all this information that's going back and forth, unless the DA wants to tell them or blah, blah, blah. On the civil side, you are a party. You are entitled to these things. So sometimes they're just not happy with the, the wheels of criminal justice. And civilly, you can start issuing, file lawsuit, issue subpoenas, take depositions. And sometimes just getting you know, it's peace of mind. It's figuring out what wow, actually wow. happened, who knew what, right? That's a very powerful thing for folks. And a lot of times I'll do lawsuits just like that pro bono, just so people get answers, right? That's all that they want. And that may be the case here. But again, when they're saying that jurisdictional thing for not more than 30,000, um, I also believe if there's, I mean, again, if they have a homeowner's policy, this was a negligent act by the parents that might be triggered. So we shall see. Interesting. And you, and you make a point I want to kind of circle back to that, the, the parents are not under a legal obligation to give up their son, right? They, they don't have to disclose information to the police that, you know, in furtherance of their investigation, but they can't cover up for him and they can't aid, you know, there's a difference between I'm not going to cooperate and I'm aiding and abetting. And if it does look like it stepped into that realm where they may have helped him escape to, you know, kind of the, the Everglades swampy area there in Florida where he was eventually found uh, or that they were um, there's a claim too that perhaps they were, uh, you know, uh, hopeful in the search for Gabby when they themselves knew that she was already dead at the time. And again, I'm, I'm not making this claim. I'm saying this is some of the things that have been reported. If it does step into that and they, they, they're getting into the area where they were, you know, close to either criminal liability or civil liability, how or I guess my question is, could that create civil liability for them? Well, yeah, well, it could create criminal liability for them, too, because what's going to happen is a lot of times, sometimes these civil lawsuits, because, again, the wheels of criminal justice just don't move fast enough or hard enough, and they're overwhelmed with other crimes and things that are happening. And then sometimes, you know, the investigator officer may be lazy. I mean, lack for a better word. Uh, civil lawsuits, I'll hire my own. If things happen like this, I have my own private investigators. We go and find out what happened. We package it up sometimes and give it to, like, guys, please go follow this, you know, 
file a criminal complaint. Look what's going on here. We, we solved this for you, right? We use private dollars to solve it for you. And sometimes it has to happen civilly. And the, you might see a timeout where they may look at criminal charges that will then stay or put on pause the civil lawsuit while they look at things criminally. But sometimes it takes that civil lawsuit of getting all that information, packaging it together, getting some of the facts together and saying it over. And who knows, maybe the parents are going to plead the fifth, like we talked about, which right. might not be a very bad thing for them because they won't have civilly have to answer questions. Because I, I think in um, it might be like one or two years to, for felony, like a statute of limitations for um in florida i don't know do you know what it is in california for them to file like an aiding and abetting type charge felony i imagine like a, i imagine it's about three years that's what most felonies are in california yeah so sometimes you'll have that civil lawsuit and it'll be stayed or paused until the timing out of that um that statute of limitations where then they can't plead in the fifth really don't matter because there's no potential criminal charge and they'll have to answer those questions so yeah. you know it does exist but this just might be an information gathering vehicle or trying to leverage to try to get some compensation to the parents who lost their daughter i mean no amount of money will bring her back but you know you still gotta you gotta do the best you can no you make such an excellent point that i i had not considered and you might be absolutely right this might be not about money at all mm. but just about getting to the bottom of things and finding out some answers to help them you know get some closure for them for such a tragic, tragic thing that they had to experience and then on the world stage. Right. Uh, Robert, thank you so much for coming in this week. Where can people find out more about you? Well, I mean, just slide into my DMs at Planet Fun Bob. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my email is robert at justiceteam.com. You can always hit me up there. Um, no, Instagram at Planet Fun Bob. I'm readily available. We do a lot of fun content on it. and. Uh, Again, like I just do all the civil stuff and a lot of things we talked about here are just very interesting because I've been on like we talked we couldn't talk about some of the cases that I'm involved with on the civil side. But these ones, these four are just very, just very interesting. I'm waiting to see how they play out. But I kind of got a good barometer where I think they're going to go. So we shall see. I like it. Thank you again. And I'm your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And you can find our Sardbar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you'd like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag, hashtag TCD Sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime Daily Sidebar.